Searching the web for the most talented, creative, and intriguing independent authors. The Emmett Blackwell Show, diving into the creative minds of sci-fi, fantasy, horror, and paranormal authors. Their fantasy is our reality. This is Emmett Blackwell. Before we begin, I want to thank you for listening. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to this channel. On this episode, I will be speaking with award-winning thriller author Ken Fry on his Lazarus series. Along with the Lazarus series, he has written The Chronicles of Aveline, Disjointed Tales, a collection of eccentric short stories, The Patmos Enigma, Red Ground, Suicide Seeds, The Bronsky Affair, two short stories, Checkmate and Is That You, Jim?, which are now free, and the second installment of the Lazarus series, Lazarus Continuum. He has achieved the solo medalist winner ebook suspense thriller award, and for the Lazarus succession, he received the 2017 New Apple Book Award, the number one best indie book of 2017 by Reed Freely, the 2017 New Apple Summer Ebook Award, and was the winner of the 2017 Ian Book of the Year Award in Christian Religious Fiction. Bronsky Affair was also a runner-up of the 2017 UK International Novel Writing Competition. We will talk about his inspirations, his characters, how he writes from the heart, and share a few laughs. So, without any further ado, let's begin. Lazarus Succession by Ken Fry Chapter 6 Present Day, Helligbert, Austria Ten milligrams of morphine sulfate slid down the syringe, through the needle, and into her outstretched arm, as she watched his arrival on the CCTV screen. She leaned her head back and released a low sigh, then took a deep breath and stood. The pain was constant, and the only thing that masked it was the morphine. It didn't take long to begin its work. Sir Maxwell Throgmorton could be her only hope. He saw her on the top step, dressed in black from head to toe, statuesque, severely elegant, and her dark hair in the same tight bun he remembered her wearing before. He could only wonder what she wanted to see him for. She ignored his outstretched hand, but with a small sweep of her arm, ushered him into the main part of the spacious chalet, whose expansive windows offered a spectacular view of the Gros Lochnir Mountains. Around the walls were packed countless volumes of books on the afterlife, near-death experiences, miracles, psychology, ancient and modern medicines, the power of the mind, holy relics, and religions. Sir Maxwell, you are welcome and thank you for coming at such short notice. I trust you had a pleasant journey. This part of the world can be quite spectacular. Her voice hadn't lost the iciness of their previous encounter. He stared into her impassive brown eyes and detected a moment's uncertainty. Yes, it was better than I imagined. Thank you for inviting me. Please, call me Max. What shall I call you? You may call me Maria. Maria? He pronounced it as if he were chewing a sweet. He lifted his head slightly. Do I detect the aroma of tea brewing? Yes, you do indeed. It has been an old family custom to greet guests with tea rather than alcohol. I trust you'll approve. She indicated a chair near a small log fire where a silver Art Nouveau tea set was placed on a matching tray. Please, sit. How do you prefer your tea? Black would be fine. Likewise. She sat down and he noticed the slight wince as she leant forward to pour from the teapot. Maria, I'm not one for small talk. It seems improbable that after meeting me for a few minutes over a week ago, you just want the pleasure of my company. Max. She hesitated as if the familiarity of using the first name of a virtual stranger was an anathema to her. I did say 
at the time that I wanted to discuss something with you. You've obviously forgotten. Her mouth had tightened as if she had tasted something unpleasant. He sipped his tea and paused. Not entirely. I just wanted to make it easier for you. I didn't drive over 400 kilometers just to sip your excellent tea. I think you'd better tell me. Of course. Throgmorton sensed she'd be economical about the real reason. But he'd have to go along with it, especially as there had to be money involved. She looked up at him with an odd expression, and again he saw her suppressed flinch. I've been researching into the effects of religion and its art on the mind and body, especially when miracles or healing appears to have occurred. I have studied this subject for many years, and I'm now finishing my fifth book on the subject, The Healing Power of Sacred Art. As part of my study, I've traveled around the world and seen many inexplicable occurrences. I've seen the stigmata appear by gazing on the supposed true cross, people unable to walk, being walking after manifesting hysteria in front of images of Christ. On that level, there isn't much I haven't seen over the years, including weeping and bleeding Madonnas, whose excretions could supposedly heal any known illness or condition. Much of it has been fraudulent, but on the odd occasion, no explanation can be offered. Throgmorton remained impassive and wished he'd get to the point. It was like a junior barrister doing a long-winded summing up. He poured himself another cup of tea. Max, I can trace my ancestry further back than the 13th century. My family came from an aristocratic and wealthy lineage. This is my third home. She waved her arm expansively. I have one in Toledo, this one, and another in Zurich. She fixed him with a blank stare. It was then he saw the yellowness of her skin that even expertly applied makeup failed to hide. I am a close friend of your ex-wife, Lady Ruth. As you know, she lives in Zurich. You need not know how and when we met, but with what she told me, plus Air Umbanic's input, who, incidentally, has represented me on occasions, I arrived at the conclusion that you might be of assistance. I hope I am not going to be disappointed. You know Ruth. That's very strange. But now I know our meeting was more deliberate than I realized. As far as your anticipated disappointment is concerned, there's no way of knowing unless you tell me what it is you have on your mind. He shifted uncomfortably. What does she know? There was no way he was going to allow himself to ask questions about Ruth or show any sign of surprise. Just what has Ruth been saying? He attempted to look unperturbed as he drummed his fingers on the tabletop. At the same time, he noticed her sharp intake of breath, her eyes closing for a moment before a look of calm relaxation crossed her face. She's in pain. Your reputation, Max, no matter how much you've attempted to disguise it, is well known in certain quarters. You're regarded as a person who has fallen from grace, but has the ability to influence, find things that shouldn't be found and lose things if necessary. Am I making myself clear? Uh, Crystal. He couldn't suppress his tight smile. Flattery, even if convoluted, was music to his ears. The way the Condessa was handling this suggested that her discretion would be paramount. I need something found, uh, a painting. It should rightfully be mine and belongs also to Toledo. All I can tell you is the artist's name, Francisco Cortes. The work was painted in the later part of the 16th century. I need it for my research, you understand. Her momentary eye contact told him that she may be good at being a condessa, but like many felons who'd stood before him on the dock, she wasn't good at lying. All relevant information is contained in this file. She reached down beside her chair and produced a dark, blue, leather-bound binder. To explain it all would take too long, and I am feeling very tired right now. Please, take this with you to study. He took the portfolio from her. 
It looked and felt expensive, secured with a decorative solid silver clasp. What next? An intriguing question, Sir Maxwell. I'm hoping you can get the wheels turning on this. Your skills in sifting through evidence and discovering truths are, I've been told, of legal legend. I'm giving you the opportunity to resurrect those skills. You know people who could help, perhaps people you shouldn't know. To be frank, I don't care about who you mix with. I want the painting and I don't want to have to wait too long. Before you ask, because I find it distasteful to discuss, you will find in the dossier details of money, fees, expenses, and commissions. You will find there is more than enough allocated to support a third party should you require it. In your own time, read what is there, then contact me directly. Now, forgive me, I must ask you to leave. I am far too tired. If you wish to stay, there are good hotels in town, or perhaps you would want to drive back. She stood and indicated the main door where he first entered. Throgmorton again experienced a sensation of dismissal, like dirt being wiped off her shoes. His angry look, the vein twitching on the side of his head, if she noticed at all, was ignored. Within minutes, he found himself alone on the outside steps and walking back to the car park. He decided to leave the area and find himself a place to eat or stay on the way back to Vienna. In his own good time, he would study her file. Her arrogance had irked. Right now, his overriding wish was that somehow he could engineer her comeuppance. She watched him drive away, deciding that former high court judge or not, he was still a slithery reptile. She balanced that observation by telling herself that reptiles were excellent at getting under closed doors. Her pain had diminished, leaving her a yawning tiredness, characteristic of her morphine use. Diagnosed with stage 2A pancreatic cancer, barring a miracle, doctors gave her a 20% chance of survival over the next five years. Having thought that she was impervious to infections and illness, the prognosis had given her a profound shock. Since that date, her research assumed a more serious aspect. What had been a harmless, light-hearted investigation into charlatans, fraudsters, and missing relics had now turned into a quest to find a genuine symbol artifact, or whatever could possibly hold the power to cure her of the all-consuming cancer. She tried many prayers, reliquaries, relics, like the Virgin's Veil, sacred sites including lords, all without success. Recently, while trawling through the 15,000 records of the Institution Columbina, in the Cathedral of Seville, she had come across a reference to the artist Francisco Cortez. It was simple. It stated that he came from Toledo, and that he was an apprentice to Salvador Mendez, and his works were highly regarded. Only three were known to exist. Two could be found at the El Prado Museum in Madrid, and the other at the Cathedral Basilica of the Assumption of Our Lady of Valencia, otherwise known as Cathedral of the Holy Chalice. It was stated that the true chalice of Christ displayed there was the one used at the Last Supper. There have been rumors of other paintings, but one had been regarded as his most influential. It was said to have been painted after he had a profound religious experience in the Toledo Cathedral. It was believed to have miraculous healing properties. Those who touched it or gazed upon it in sincere repentance would be cured. It had never been found nor was the title ever known. The records indicated that Cortez and his painting had vanished in mysterious circumstances and were never seen again. Her first reaction had been one of annoyed astonishment. She had lived in Toledo most of her life and had never heard of him. With her condition, she couldn't prevent the thought that this was too much of a coincidence. The two works that were held at the El Prado were not on display. They had been stored, Using her title of Condessa, it hadn't been difficult to persuade the museum to allow her access. She remembered the curator walking her down a cold and spiraling staircase into an immense space, like a warehouse where rack upon rack of paintings, no longer fashionable or showing their years, were stored for inspection and restoration. The curator explained that humidity was always a problem and temperatures had to remain constant. Some paintings reacted badly to light, 
and could only be shown for limited periods of time. Cortez's paintings had their own resting place. The curator had written its location on a large white card taken from the database. He had found them without difficulty. With care, he slid them from their bay, placing them next to each other as if he were holding a newborn baby. Both works were identical proportions and framed in heavy gilt surrounds. She gasped at her first glance. They were like nothing she had ever seen before. They looked like superior amalgamations of El Greco, Corrigio, and Murillo. Both depicted healing miracles of Christ. One showed a leper, and the other of a herd of swine being driven over a cliff top. For their time, they had an almost abstract quality, swirling dark and light colors, blacks and blazing reds, with suggestions of triumphant yet penitent figures emerging from the swirling eddy of colors. Wonderful! Oh, they're just wonderful! She experienced the strangest emotion, a feeling of disembodiment, a spark of rare happiness. It went as quickly as it had come. Yes, they are truly superb agreed the curator, holding them at arm's length. And they are due for showing in another two years. I think then we shall see a reappraisal of Cortez. The shame is that after he vanished, it was said that his works were destroyed in a large monastery fire. But nobody can verify that. According to the stories, he apparently thought his life was unworthy and later rode off into the desert and disappeared forever. Sadly, nothing has ever been found. The Condessa nodded. The curator had confirmed her feelings. The images she had seen and the story surrounding Cortez haunted her for the rest of the day. They caused her to tremble. She tried looking at other works, but Cortez kept flooding into her mind. Her intuition sent her an invitation. Later, she booked a flight from Madrid to Valencia, before her scheduled return to Zurich. I am back with the author, Ken Fry. Hey, Ken, how are you doing out there today? Uh, I'm pretty cool. Um, it's hot out here in the UK, and unusually <laughs> so. Well, okay, carry on. <laughs> so, now the excerpt was excellent. You know, it really pulls the reader in about these artifacts that you have in your story. And my question is, because you have so much research behind this, when did you begin writing? How did you get started in this whole thing? Well, I mean, I've been writing for, dabbling around for many years, but never, ever, ever finished a story. And it's only until about the last five or six years and I decided to do uh, something a little bit more serious. So then I started up, and that's how it, that's how it went. In. Um, <laughs> it's peculiar. Um, I find I have a cupboard with lots of papers and stuff in it, and I find half-written stories all over the place. And I think, good God, <laughs> where do they come from? <laughs> so that's how it all starts. Uh, there you go. Well, that's good. Uh, now, as far as a writer, now you, you've probably been influenced by other writers. Who have you personally been influenced by? Well, you're asking me a, a very important question there. Um, if I look at what I've been influenced by, there must have been five or six writers in my, in my time which uh, have particularly sort of got to me. Um, uh, if I start with the first one, it will be somebody like, they're all American, would you believe? Yeah. <laughs> would you not believe? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> and according to most British people, we don't even have a good handle on the English language. So I don't know how, <laughs> how we could do so good. Your spelling is weird. But, <laughs> <laughs> but when I take it from the first point, uh, Henry James. Um, Henry James. The Portrait of a Lady. Mm. If I look at that book, I, I, I'm astonished about the observations and the skill with which he portrays people's emotions and so forth. It, it's slightly out of fashion these days. But my God, uh, I just, God, I, I wish I could write like that. <laughs> 
Well, you're not too far from that. I mean, really, the way you write is pretty amazing. You really pull people into your story without – it almost seems like you're not even trying because it's just so easy. I mean, I I feel as though, like, even when you were talking about in the the excerpt, when you were talking about Maria and her struggle, at the same time she's still trying to keep her own composure – um, that right there, I mean, just about anybody has been through a situation like that or seen somebody in a situation like that, and they can totally relate. So, yeah. I mean, yeah. Well, I, I got four or five major writers which have influenced me. Now, now, do you know Kate Chopin? She's another American female in the late 19th century. Um, God, the way she wrote, she wrote a thing called The Awakening, and... Uh, Oh. It was amazing. She was considered quite shocking, and uh, I thought, God Almighty, what a what a wonderful piece of writing! Um, it was unbelievable for its time. But what she did was daring. Mm-hmm. The ending, the ending of a story, and uh, the awakening. If you ever read Victor Hugo's *The Toilers of the Sea*, it was almost similar. Mm-hmm. It was beautiful. When I go across that, I go on to Ernest Hemingway, mm-hmm. <laughs> who you're doing probably know more. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure there's a whole ton of college yeah. kids right now that are reading a, Ernest Hemingway. He was a great, was a great chauvinist, but uh, <laughs> his, his stories were brilliant, absolutely brilliant. That short, sharp, snappy stuff he wrote was, was unbelievable. I don't know where he got that from, but... Uh, they said he spent hours sort of editing what he wrote. Oh, goodness me. Yeah, it almost and makes then, you wonder if you could find those stories that were unedited, yeah. all the things he wanted to say. <laughs> I, I visited his, his house in Cuba. Yeah. Uh, you couldn't go in it. They wouldn't let you in. But it, it was. I could see all, all the books around and all the bottles of vodka. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It, it was brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Uh, so we, uh, have you heard of Sebastian Folks? Oh yeah, yep. Yeah. Well, uh, he's a great fan. Of, I'm a great fan of his, and I've got signed first editions of his in my bookcase here. Wow. Uh, uh, the graphic, horrific First World War stuff. Mm-hmm. It, I, I just thought he was wonderful. Zola, Emil Zola, hmm? German Island, the Earth. Oh, my God, such realistic. So naturalistic stuff. It can't be better. So, yeah, I I can't say much more. (laughs) Ask me another question, please. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. So now the character um, Throgmorton, okay? Yeah. Um, Yeah. Very kind of cool guy. Now, (laughs) I I like him. I I do. I really like him. Um, Now, does he appear throughout the, the whole series? It appears through the whole book, but uh, it has a demise at the end. <laughs> oh, oh! you just gave it away. <laughs> Sorry. The spoiler <laughs> alert, everybody. <laughs> you know how it happens. But, uh, he's an almost uh, lovable, disgusting sort of human being. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that's what makes a good, diverse hero. Yeah. <laughs> Carry on. Carry on. <laughs> so now, um, now this book it has some artifacts in it that they're looking for. In sure. the next book, do you do you kind of follow that same theme? Yeah, sure, I do. So, what's the the next artifact that they're going to be looking for? Lazarus finishes at a particular point, and the artifact, which is the painting, has to have a demise, mm-hmm. and it has a demise, and. Somebody has to take that demise over. Um, that's how it works. It, it, I, I don't want to say too much to give away the story. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's okay. Now, you do a lot of research on your novels. Uh, do you ever find yourself kind of in a whirlwind adventure like the characters in your book, or does this all happen between the pages of a uh, textbook? I get caught up in research very much, which is my big thing. And uh, uh, I suddenly find myself tangenting off <laughs> story into research, which sometimes is not appropriate. <laughs> well, that's okay, because honestly, there's so many books 
with it's almost like you take a story or not a story, but you take a um, a research book. You start on one little subject, you branch off, and then you branch off, and then you branch off to the point to where you're <laughs> filling in these blanks. It's amazing. Yeah, it's so true. <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing a book at the moment which takes me into deep sea cave diving and all of a sudden I'm going from here, there, everywhere looking up this, looking up that <laughs> it, just, it, just, it just gets almost ridiculous you can't, you can't take it all on <laughs> so basically on your web browser you probably have maybe 32 open tabs of different information you're looking at <laughs> Either that, or you just you don't shut hey, books anymore. You just leave them yeah, open because they need to be accessed. Uh, no, you're absolutely right. No, no, check on my history on on Google. Oh God, <laughs> <laughs> what am I doing here? <laughs> but but it it works for me. And uh, my big thing at university was research, and that's that's what I was good at. And uh, mm-hmm. uh, if you take a, a particular incident in someone's life. And you can actually dissect that incident page, dick, 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 page by page by page. You suddenly realize there's more to it than just sort of putting it on a page. There's a whole lot more going on. And you know what? You, you kind of influence your readers in a lot of ways, too, because even I, when I was reading just the excerpt and the beginning of the book, I was kind of looking into these things on the Internet saying, man, now that is cool. And then I had, you know, 12 tabs open, not nearly the 32 tabs that you have open, but still, I mean, <laughs> it, it gets you thinking. It really does. Um, I was reading um, Chapter 6, um, and when it talks about the art, um, I was kind of intrigued because, you know, around the Catholic world, they have, you know, different artifacts that have either been touched by Christ or, you know, they yeah. have some form of connection to Christ. And it is it is amazing that, that you're able to find these things and put them into a book and almost create a whole new timeline of what may have happened. And, you know, that's that's the best kind of fiction I love. Okay, I'm a big fan of science fiction, but at the yeah. same time, it almost makes it like, you're filling in the blanks of what history hasn't told you, you know, and, and you do an excellent job at it because that gets people like me saying, what if, you know, and that's great. You know, that's exactly <laughs> what your reader needs to be saying all the time. But, um, yeah, that's you. You got it right well, there. Well, anyway, when you look at this thing about uh, Lazarus, it, it was all to do with an artist who was uh, at the scene of Lazarus being raised from the dead. Mm-hmm. which was Christ's last miracle. And uh, he's been told to portray it by, by Christ himself. And when, when he comes out of his state, all he finds is the bandages around him which wound Lazarus' body. And he takes them away and begins to paint them uh, as a picture. Which the picture is then lost for hundreds of years or thousands of years. And uh, then when it reappears and the whole thing starts all over again and uh, uh, a whole load of <laughs> silly miracles have been to appear. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. Oh, the, there we go. oh, that's fine. I mean, just like I was saying about the story, you, you honestly, you capture that essence of mystery. Something that honestly, you know, we got the internet. We've got the World Wide Web of information. There's very few mysteries left in this world, you know. There is no golden monkey out somewhere that we can all go travel to hopefully find um, because it just it's just not there anymore. I mean, I'm thinking Indiana Jones type stuff, Dan Brown type stuff. You've captured it. You're falling into that same niche, and it's awesome. The, if, if you're out there and you're listening, folks, I want to tell you one thing. This Lazarus series that he's got going is captivating, okay? It really draws you in and makes you think. Um, that there may be something behind some of this research that Ken's doing. So, in any case, um, Ken, it, it's awesome that you've done such a good job on it. Thank you. So, and well, I, I got another question here for you. Because, damn. now, I like Throgmorton. Throgmorton's a pretty cool guy. <laughs> <laughs> He's an asshole. Yeah. <laughs> what, yeah, well, still. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about it. Like that out. <laughs> 
Yeah. And folks, I'm not an asshole. Okay. But no, <laughs> I just thought he was a pretty cool guy. He, he doesn't really take too many punches. Uh, he just uh, tells it like it is. And that's pretty cool. Um, but, but anyhow, now, if you could be any one of the characters, Ken, who would you be in your series? I would be Brody. Oh, really? Really? And why is that? Yeah. Because it's kind of calculating. Uh, he's, he's available for emotional experiences, which he doesn't understand, but they hit him. He's got a cool head. And he's, he's cynical, but his cynicism is uh, un- can be undermined. <laughs> mm. I loved it. There we go. Well, I mean... I tell you what, it's just great that you've pulled in so many different characters. Now, the Maria character, okay, she's struggling with this disease, right? She became enraptured by the idea that there was something out there which could help her in the way of a painting. And the painting was painted in her home city, which she knew nothing about, it was just Toledo. Hmm. And, uh, so that's where it went. Hmm. I tell you, and, and that's another thing. I mean, if, if you can identify with Brody, if I can identify with Throgmorton, um, <laughs> I know people I know people out there who can identify with somebody who's going through that type of cancer situation. And I'll tell everybody on this show, whoever comes and listens to it, the characters that you write about, if they're not relatable, if they're not able to capture one or two of the readers out there, then you might need to revise it. And Ken, you've done an excellent job at doing that. You've you've taken almost like small snippets of the way that we all think and you've put them into characters that can be relatable. And that's part of this whole story that that really makes it so captivating. So I do appreciate you doing that. Well, that, that's very kind of you to say so and uh, it, it it comes from the heart, not from the mind. So now I have one last question for you, and this is something because, I mean, Ken, I've been watching your work for a while now, okay, and you're doing an excellent job. You've done quite a bit of marketing on your book, okay, and when it comes to doing your marketing, you actually have a book manager, and uh, we've actually had her on the show before. Her name was Eva Lancaster, and now when you hand that responsibility of marketing off to somebody else, does that help you? Absolutely. I trust and uh, believe in what she does and never had a complaint. Everything she takes off me, everything most of us had to do. Mm. So she does all my marketing, all my book managing. All I have to do, literally, uh, Emmett, is write. That takes from me away all the social media rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Sorry about that. <laughs> Don't worry. Nobody from Twitter is listening or Facebook. No, no. <laughs> no, it's okay. I understand. It's quite a web, you know. That's why they curl, call it the World Wide Web uh, because it can be confusing and it can be quite a bit to do. So, oh, I mean, it's, it's very intimidating at times because sometimes the language and what you have to go through. Is takes hours, and I don't have those hours to spend. I all I have hours to spend is to, is to tap keys and uh, write notes, and that's it. Yeah, I tell you, um, with all the social media things and everything that I do, um, my pillow doesn't have any wrinkles on it because it only sees my head for about 15 minutes before I'm up again. So, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's fine. It's fine. Coffee just kind of flows through my house. <laughs> don't. don't. <laughs> So anyhow, so one more question, just one. What advice would you give a new author? I would say, apart from all the mechanics of formatting and all that rubbish which we have to go through, if you're a writer, if you're a writer, write from your heart, your total heart. Let your emotions flow. The intellect is a robber. The intellect is a robber. Mm -hmm. You can employ the intellect at the end of it, when you finished it and written it. Um, I don't know if that makes sense, but there we go. Yeah, well, it makes sense to a lot of people who are listening. And I want to say thank you so much, Ken, for being on the show. You really are a master at your craft. And it's, it's you know, it's a privilege to, to have you on here because it's almost like talking to a celebrity in a lot of ways because of the writing style. And when you read something, I want to tell you guys out there who are listening to the show, when you read something this good, 
and you get pulled into a story so well and you're able to talk to the person, that's what I love about this job. So, yes. Ken, thank you. Thank you so much for being here on the show today. I do appreciate it. Emmett, thank you for having me. Okay. All Emmett. right. And uh, I just want to remind everybody out there to like, share, subscribe to this channel. And this is Emmett Blackwell signing out. Keep on reading and keep on writing, my friends. Searching the web for the most talented, creative, and intriguing independent authors. The Emmett Blackwell Show, diving into the creative minds of sci-fi, fantasy, horror, and paranormal authors. Their fantasy is our reality.